couple of years ago, I made a video on chronometric dating in which I focus mainly on radiocarbon dating, but also the kinds of errors that can occur with any kind of archaeological dating and what we can do about them. In that video, I focus quite a bit on using the software OxCal in order to calibrate dates, but also to do Bayesian modeling of dates in order to come up with really precise chronologies. Uh, I discovered recently that OxCal has completely redone its interface so that all of the instructions I give you in that video are no longer valid. So in today's video, I'm redoing the section on OxCal. I'm going to repeat some of the things from that previous video that are still OK, and I'll also do some uh, new stuff in this video that wasn't in that video. Before I get to the specific section on OxCal, I'll start off this video by discussing some more general issues about archaeological data that apply not just to radiocarbon dating, but to various kinds of methods, including what do we consider to be an event that we want to date, and how do those events relate to the kinds of events that these methods allow us, allow us to date, because they're quite often not the same thing. And that can be one of several factors that can contribute to errors in archaeological dates. Uh, like, like most things, there can be errors, and the point is how to, how to deal with those errors and correct for them when we can. One of the terms you'll see archaeologists use is chronometric dating. Now what archaeologists mean by that term is the use of any dating method that gives us a result on an interval scale. In other words, a measurement of age in years. Always with an error term around it. We don't get an exact result by and large. We get uh, most of the methods that can give us chronometric dates. Uh, give us a probabilistic estimate of the date, so there's always an error term, um, with the exception of uh, chronometric dates that are based on written records, like dates on coins and that sort of thing, uh, which we often call absolute dating. In the case of ones that come from written records, so we can actually date things precisely to a year, uh, usually we describe that as absolute dating, uh, whereas chronometric dating usually is based on some physical process that has a relationship to time and thus allows us to date things. For archaeological dating to be meaningful, we have to be specific about the events we're trying to date. Just asking, how old is the site, is really not sufficient. When we ask a question like that, what do we really mean? Conceivably, we're actually talking about two dates, the beginning and end of occupation at the site. But in reality, there are probably thousands of potentially datable events that took place at the site, almost none of which correspond with either the beginning or the end of occupation. We might just as well ask, how old is this glass of beer? Just as with the archaeological site, this question is too vague, and we need to be more specific about what we're dating. For example, are we asking how long ago the beer was brewed, or how long ago it was poured? These are two distinct events that would have taken place at different times. Let's say we're interested in when the beer was poured. We next need to think about what kind of process or clock we can use to measure the time since pouring. One candidate might be change in the temperature of the beer. Another might be decline in the height of the head or froth on top of the beer. No matter whether we're dating sites or beer, dating has several requirements, beginning with specification of a potentially datable event. For example, we might be interested in dating the destruction of a settlement by fire. We also need a process with a known or knowable rate that we can use as a clock and something that resets that clock at a time that's as close as possible to the event of interest. And finally, we need to know the starting conditions for that process. In the case of our glass of beer, that might be the temperature of the beer or the height of the head right after it was poured. Believe it or not, people have actually studied this. Here you see some results from a study that compared several types of beer for the rates at which the heads declined. As you can see here, Right after the pouring, the Erdinger beer had a higher head than did the Budweiser. The Erdinger's head also took longer to decline in height. Notice that in both cases, the decline is not linear. Instead, it's exponential, with faster decline in the first few seconds and very slow decline after about 200 seconds. As it turns out, exponential curves like this happen with a lot of processes in nature. And one way to describe the rate of decline is the half-life, the time it takes for the head to decline to half of its starting value. In the case of the Erdinger, this half-life is 190 seconds, while the Budweiser's head has a half-life of 116 seconds. As we'll see shortly, this is a good analogy for many of the processes that are used for dating in archaeology. 
The dates we determine for archaeological events are always subject to various sources of error, but the most common source of error is lack of clarity over which event we're actually dating. In a paper he published in 1978, Jeffrey Dean usefully distinguished between three kinds of events. The target event is the event we're actually interested in. The reference event is some potentially datable event that we hope is close to the target event. And the dated event is the event that we're actually able to date with the method at our disposal. Ideally, these would all be the same, but generally they're not. For example, the target event might be the last use of a hearth. The reference event might be the cutting of a branch from a tree to use as fuel. And the dated event might be the growth of the outermost tree ring on the piece of charcoal that's preserved in the hearth. Unfortunately, we don't know how much time elapsed between the cutting of the branch and its use as fuel in the hearth. Nor do we know how many tree rings were burned off of the piece of wood before it was left as a piece of charcoal. To deal with these kinds of situations, Dean defined two kinds of dating discrepancies. When the reference event is earlier than the target event, Dean calls this a disjunction. When the reference event is after the target event, he calls this a disparity. Using the example of dendrochronology or tree ring dating, we can illustrate these terms graphically. Let's say our target event is the construction of a room in a pueblo. If we were really lucky, we might find a roof beam in that pueblo that still had its bark and that was used in construction immediately after it was cut. In that case, the dated event, the growth of the outermost tree ring, would be virtually identical to both the cutting date and the use of the tree in construction. So we'd have no disjunction or disparity. More realistically, there'd be some time lag between the cutting of the tree and its use in construction. This lag would be a type of disjunction that Dean calls a hiatus. But most of the time, there is another source of disjunction that results from the outer rings not being preserved. Rings may be missing because of woodworking, or because of burning, or just poor preservation. Dean calls this difference between the dated event and the reference event a gap. And the combination of gap and hiatus makes the disjunction. On the other hand, we can have errors in the other direction. For example, if we try to date room construction by using a piece of wood that came from a hearth or from a repair, there'd be a significant risk that both the reference event and the dated event post-date the room construction. This would be a disparity. Of course, it's also possible that that piece of wood from a later repair or a hearth was also stockpiled or was missing outer tree rings. In that event, the different sources of error would partially cancel out. Long before Dean's article, archaeologists were using two other terms to describe dating discrepancies. These are less precise than Dean's terms, but are still useful. Terminus postquem refers to a reference event that gives the oldest possible date for a target event, while terminus antiquem refers to a reference event that must be later than the target event. For example, when you're trying to date the formation of an archaeological deposit, and you find a dated coin or token in that deposit whose date you can presume to be accurate, such as this 1837 dated bank token from Lower Canada, we know that that deposit could not have formed earlier than 1837. In this case, the dated event and the reference date are both 1837, but there was likely a hiatus of unknown duration between the striking of the coin and its discard or loss in the deposit. So, assuming that the excavation was careful and there was no bioturbation, such as animal burrowing, that could have introduced the coin, we can only say that the deposit was formed sometime after 1836. By contrast, terminus antiquem applies to situations where the deposit we're interested in dating is sealed by some event, such as the construction of a building, whose date is known. In such cases, any archaeological deposits underneath the building have to be older than the building itself. This can happen in cases where we have historical evidence for construction events, or things like dated cornerstones on buildings. These days, the premier method for chronometric dating in archaeology is radiocarbon dating. So it's important to understand the basics of how it works, what kinds of errors you can anticipate, and how to interpret the results. Like all carbon atoms, carbon-14 has six protons, but it has eight neutrons instead of six, which makes it unstable. 
Carbon-14 occurs in Earth's atmosphere because protons and atomic nuclei traveling at nearly the speed of light crash into atoms in the upper atmosphere. This ejects a number of particles, including neutrons, some of which collide with the nuclei of other atoms in the atmosphere, namely nitrogen, since it's the most abundant element in air. When these collisions happen, the nitrogen atom ejects a proton. So now, instead of having seven protons and seven neutrons, the atom's nucleus has six protons and eight neutrons, making it a radioactive carbon-14 atom. Like other carbon atoms in the atmosphere, this carbon-14 is bound up with other atoms, especially oxygen in the form of carbon dioxide. And the carbon-14 gets incorporated into plants through photosynthesis. Consequently, there's carbon-14 in all living plants, as well as all the animals that eat those plants, and all the animals that eat those animals. When any of those plants or animals die, they stop absorbing atmospheric carbon-14. And this resets the clock. Because carbon-14 is radioactive, it decays over time. One of the excess neutrons randomly turns into a proton and ejects a beta particle. This turns the carbon atom back into a nitrogen atom. Much as with the head on the beer that we saw earlier, the amount of carbon-14 in organic material begins to decline exponentially after the plant or animal's death. But the rate of decline is fairly slow declining to half its original value after about 5,730 years. This is the half-life of carbon-14. The amount of carbon-14 in the material is down to one-quarter its original abundance after two half-lives, and down to one-eighth after three half-lives. There's more than one way to measure the amount of carbon-14 in formerly living material, but the best are some version of accelerator mass spectrometry. For this method, after pretreatment to remove contaminants, the material is turned first into carbon dioxide gas and then into pure carbon or graphite. It's then placed in a chamber where it's bombarded to create negative ions, because this is a good way to get rid of any nitrogen-14 that might remain in the material. The negative ions shoot down through the system and are turned by large magnets, and a tandem accelerator at several million volts accelerates the particles further. Halfway through the accelerator, a metal foil or a gas strips the electrons off of the particles. This causes any molecules that might have masses close to 14 to disintegrate, making it easier to distinguish the carbon-14 from other particles. After the beam travels through more magnets, which bend the pathways of light particles more than they do the heavy particles, the part of the beam that should be made up only of carbon-14 particles goes through a window into a gas ionization detector, where the particles are counted. The much more abundant carbon-12 and carbon-13 atoms are counted in Faraday cups earlier in the line. The ratios of carbon-14 to carbon-12 and carbon-13 can be used to calculate the age of the material that was put in the negative ion source. We might expect that bones, teeth, and antler of animals would be ideal materials for radiocarbon dating because the animals stop absorbing carbon-14 from the food they eat when they die. The reality is somewhat more complicated than that, in part because the bones could contain carbon that was absorbed several years prior to death, and in part because buried bone could have poor preservation of the organic components of the bone, which mainly consists of collagen fibrils. We also should be alert to the possibility that poorly preserved bone could contain carbon contamination from the soil. While marine animals, like fish, absorb their carbon-14 not from the atmosphere, but from seawater. And this also has an impact on the humans and other animals that eat those marine animals. A very common material for radiocarbon dating in archaeological contexts is wood charcoal. However, as I've already noted in this video, there are a number of problems with the use of wood charcoal, mainly having to do with the fact that tree rings are missing and we don't know what ki other kinds of discrepancies there may be. For example, we usually won't know whether the wood was recently cut and then burned and deposited in a short time frame or was stockpiled or used as an architectural element in a long-lived building.
Such issues make charcoal very prone to disjunctions and disparities. Plants with much shorter lifetimes have a lot more potential than wood in this respect, as long as they're preserved by charring, waterlogging, or very dry conditions. Charred seeds are among the more common of these types of plant remains, and we tend to call them short-lived material. The charring usually results from human activities, and we can generally expect that those humans would have harvested the seeds only a few years at most prior to their burning. Other short-lived materials include basketry and other textiles, namely cloth, although these only tend to be preserved under exceptional circumstances. The Shroud of Turin is one such example, and radiocarbon dating exposed it as a medieval forgery. Mollusk shells are also potentially datable. However, marine mollusks get their carbon-14 from seawater, not from the atmosphere. While snails may even get a lot of their carbon from limestone, which contains no carbon-14 at all. It's also possible to radiocarbon date the humus in soil. However, the carbon in humus accumulates from rootlets and other kinds of biological activities over very long time scales, so it's hard to imagine how useful such dates could be. By now you should realize that there are quite a few things that can complicate radiocarbon dating, potentially leading to large errors. And you may have seen books, websites, or YouTube videos that claim that these problems completely undermine the value of radiocarbon dating. However, their authors fail to mention that we can correct for most of these errors, and their dismissal of radiocarbon dating is generally due to some alternative history agenda. Rather than dismiss radiocarbon dating, it makes sense to learn how to deal with whatever errors there may be. After all, radiocarbon dating remains one of our best dating methods. Taylor outlines the main sources of errors in radiocarbon dating as falling into four general categories. Contextual errors are very important sources of error, and include the disjunctions and disparities of Dean's classification. Problems here may stem from the fact that the reference event might be the death of an organism, or the dated event might be the formation of a particular tree ring or group of tree rings, while the target event could be considerably later or earlier than those events. Worse yet, the archaeologist might be unclear about what the target event even is. Stratigraphic errors also contribute to this source of error. Compositional errors result when the ratios of the various carbon isotopes in the material do not reflect their ratios in the atmosphere even at the time that the organism was alive. This happens because many organic processes can alter these ratios, photosynthesis among them. Fortunately, labs can usually correct for this, and that's one of the reasons we look at carbon-12 to 13 ratios and not just the carbon-14. Another compositional source of error is contamination. It doesn't take very much modern carbon to make the material seem much younger than it actually is. Systemic effects stem from errors in Libby's original assumptions about the radiocarbon method. He assumed that the amount of carbon-14 in the atmosphere was pretty much constant over time, but we now know that it fluctuates quite a lot. Some of these fluctuations appear to be due to sunspot activity, and some to variations in the Earth's magnetic field. Both of these things would affect the rate of carbon-14 production in the upper atmosphere. Since the Industrial Revolution, the burning of millions of tons of coal released very old carbon into the atmosphere, while nuclear bomb tests during the 20th century had the opposite effect by creating large amounts of carbon-14. He also measured the half-life of carbon-14 as 5,568 years, and today our best estimate is that it's 5,730 plus or minus 30 years. Libby also assumed that atmospheric radiocarbon was the same all over the world, but we now know that it varies between the northern and southern hemispheres. We also know that in some cases there are so-called reservoir effects. For example, marine organisms get a substantial amount of their carbon-14 from the seawater, and the oceans mix only slowly with the atmosphere so oceanic carbon-14 is not at the same abundance as atmospheric carbon-14. There are even some organisms, like snails, that get some of their carbon from very old sources, like limestone. Fortunately, we can usually correct for these effects, and a very important tool for this 
has been tracking the secular variations in carbon-14 abundance through tree ring dating or dendrochronology. This results in calibrations that I'll return to in a little bit. Finally, we have measurement errors. An unavoidable source of error is the statistical error that results whenever we count things. The counting of carbon-14 and other atoms is a sampling process, so there's always sampling error. But fortunately, we can model these statistical errors with a Gaussian distribution. This contributes to the uncertainty that we get on radiocarbon dates. But there can be other kinds of measurement error that actually cause our measurements to be inaccurate. For example, it's possible that the accelerator mass spectrometer or the decay counting equipment might not be working properly. There can also be human error, as simple as mislabeling something. We can only mitigate these kinds of errors with lab protocols that minimize their occurrence. Not long after people began to realize that there were some problems with Libby's initial assumptions, people started using dates on tree rings in order to calibrate the radiocarbon sequence to correct for secular variation. Even as long ago as about 1970, scientists had created dendrochronological sequences from overlapping sets of tree rings going back about 8,000 years. And carbon dates on tree rings of known date allowed them to track the secular variation in carbon-14 in the atmosphere. With that information, we can make graphs that show the relationship between calendar ages, or calibrated dates, and the radiocarbon determination, or radiocarbon date. Typically, that relationship, or calibration curve, has lots of little wiggles in it. If we're really lucky, as in this case, the radiocarbon determination might intersect a very steep portion of this wiggly curve. When this happens, we can get a very precise date with a single most likely solution. But if we're less lucky, the radiocarbon determination intersects what we call a plateau in the curve with lots of wiggles that result in a much more spread out calibrated date. In such cases, we don't get a very precise result no matter what precision we had for our original determination. Advances in dendrochronology and chronological information from other sources, like varves and coral reefs, has now allowed us to extend this calibration curve much farther back in time than was originally the case, albeit with much less precision for the older parts of the curve. It's also possible to correct for marine reservoir effects. One of the ways to correct for reservoir effects is to compare the radiocarbon dates on coral with those determined independently by uranium-thorium dating. Reservoir offsets vary by geographical location, so it's necessary to determine the offset for the specific place where the carbon specimen originated. A number of software platforms have been developed to help us calibrate and interpret radiocarbon dates. Of these alternatives, the one that's most widely used is OxCal from Oxford University. The URL for OxCal brings you to its home page. You can read the online manual as well as begin calibrating dates. You can either download the OxCal software to your own computer or register as a user for their online platform. Once you're registered, for the online version, you begin by logging in. You type your username and then password, and then click OK. If you only want to calibrate one or two dates, you can start by clicking on the Calibrate button. Usually, you'd use the name field to type the lab number for your determination. Then you type the uncalibrated determination BP, and use the uncertainty field to type the error on the date. From the Options menu, you can select which calibration curve to use. For terrestrial dates in the Northern Hemisphere, that would usually be IntCal 20. We then click OK, and then Run. You next see a small segment of the calibration curve, with the Gaussian distribution of the uncalibrated determination at left, and the probability density function for the calibrated date at the bottom. The bar below the probability density function shows the credible interval for the date, in this case the 95.4% probability range. This interval runs from 6228 
to 6081 calibrated BC. In this case, we were very unlucky with our date. The determination intersected a substantial plateau, which resulted in a much more spread out and imprecise calibrated date. It's often useful to explore the calibration curve in the region where we anticipate getting dates. This can sometimes help us decide which specimens to submit for radiocarbon dating and whether or not to go for high precision on those dates. To do that, we click on View Curve, and unless we want to change which calibration curve we're using, we click View. Alternatively, we can use the drop-down menu to select a different calibration curve. There are also options that allow you to do things like changing the resolution of the curve. As we scroll through the calibration curve, we see mostly wiggly areas punctuated by areas of very steep segments where we would likely get very precise dates, as well as periodic plateaus. including the last few centuries. This one results from the combined effects of the Industrial Revolution, which put massive amounts of old carbon into the atmosphere from burning coal, and nuclear bomb testing from the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, which increased the abundance of carbon-14 in the atmosphere. Software like OxCal and BCal doesn't just allow you to calibrate dates or explore the calibration curve, it also provides a suite of tools that you can use to analyze sets of radiocarbon dates. What makes the software really valuable is that it uses a Bayesian framework to incorporate the radiocarbon dates into other kinds of chronological information, especially stratigraphy. Returning for a moment to that overly vague question, how old is the site, you might be tempted to determine the beginning and end of occupation by emphasizing the oldest and latest of the dates that are available. In fact, some archaeologists have used the lower end of the credible interval for the oldest date and the upper end of the credible interval for the youngest date as the boundaries of the site's occupation. You really should avoid this temptation, as this approach results in highly unrealistic dates for the site and exaggerates the duration of occupation. After all, this approach not only emphasizes dates that might well be outliers, it also ignores the possibility that the oldest dates may well have large disjunctions, and it completely ignores the context of the radiocarbon determinations. You should instead take advantage of the modeling tools within the software and use models that explicitly take the contextual information into account. So, what do I mean by models? Here are three simple examples for purposes of illustration. Each has three periods of time, early, middle, and late archaic, each bounded by two events, the beginning and the end of the period. In model A, at the top, the periods overlap. In model B, they abut, and in model C, there are gaps between the periods. Here we see a more detailed model for a sequence of events at a site that includes a use of a hearth and the deposit of some charred barley. Some charcoal in the deposit below the hearth might have a disjunction, but could provide a terminus postquem for that deposit and the hearth above it. Charred seeds or twigs from the hearth itself might give us a pretty good date for the last use of the hearth, but large chunks of charcoal from that same hearth might display large disjunctions. Carbon dates on charred barley from a pit that's stratigraphically above the hearth should be expected to postdate the last use of the hearth. The Bayesian analyses that OxCal can help us perform would take all this information into account. In Bayesian terms, we call this prior information. To demonstrate chronological modeling, let's start with a really simple model, this one from southern Ontario, Canada. It has three periods of time, Point Peninsula, Princess Point, and early Ontario Iroquoian, and we're making no assumptions about the relationships between them although we have reason to believe that Point Peninsula is the oldest period and early Ontario Iroquoian is the youngest. Notice that this model leaves open the possibility that the periods overlap in time. Each rectangle in the model is kind of an envelope for the radiocarbon dates we may have, and we can use Bayesian analysis to try to find the beginnings and endings of these envelopes.
However, we should keep in mind that these beginnings and endings may not correspond exactly to the beginnings and endings of the periods. That's because our dates only provide a sample of the events that could have taken place in one of these periods, and also because some of the dates could display disjunctions or disparities. We'll build this model in OxCal, but it's always a good idea to make a little sketch like this before you try to implement it on a computer. Assuming we're still logged in, we click on New Project. This brings us to a panel in the Model view. But we can also use other views, so from the View menu, let's pick List. And from the Tools menu, we'll make sure we're using the IntCal 20 calibration curve. That's because the Ontario determinations we're using come from terrestrial sites in the Northern Hemisphere. We then go to the Insert menu, click on Models, and then on Sequence, give the sequence a name, and then click on Insert. You'll note that this inserts a line of code in our list view of the model. Going back to the Insert menu, we click on Boundary, and then type a name to designate the beginning of a phase or period. Next, click on the dot at the beginning of the line for the end boundary. Clicking on these dots is the way to mark the cursor location for the code. In this case, it allows us to enter a phase between the two boundaries. We give the phase a name, and then click Insert, again adding it to the code. By clicking on the dot just below Phase, we can begin entering radiocarbon determinations for that phase by going back to the Insert menu and selecting R Date. In the Name field, type the lab number for the first radiocarbon determination. In the Carbon-14 Date field, type the uncalibrated determination itself, and then the standard error in the Uncertainty field. We then click Insert to add it to the code. Repeat this process for every radiocarbon determination in the first group. Note that these are uncalibrated radiocarbon dates BP. Once we've finished entering the radiocarbon determinations for the first group, we add another boundary to end the phase. We change the word start in our name to end to designate the event that ends our period. And repeat the process with the next group of dates, beginning with establishing the boundaries and then a phase. and then entering the dates themselves. When we finish adding dates for the phase, once again we have to close it off with another boundary. By clicking Model, then Boundary, and then naming the end boundary. We then go through exactly the same procedures for the third phase. Because that's very repetitive, I'll speed things up. We next check our work, and I see that I've made a mistake here. By omitting the word start, on one of the boundaries. So, after clicking on that line of code, I go to the Edit menu, scroll down to Edit, and then add the word Start to the end of the name. After checking once again to make sure there are no errors, we might use the View menu to change to the Model view. This presents the model with time flowing from the oldest at the top to the youngest at the bottom. But we can also select the second item on the View menu to make time flow in the other direction, with oldest on the bottom and youngest at the top. This is generally more natural to archaeologists who tend to think of things stratigraphically. Notice that the various elements of the model are preceded by dots, just as in the list view. You can select elements by clicking on those dots and then either delete, cut, copy, or paste them.
just as in the list view. If you wish, you may also select Code View that displays your model simply as plain text. When we've finished entering everything and checked it to make sure there are no mistakes, we go back to the File menu and save our work, giving the project a name. and click on Save. We next go back to the File menu and scroll down to Run. This will run the model. A status panel will open to show the progress of the model as it's running. The three blue bars will gradually increase to the right, and the gradually increasing number shows the number of passes or iterations. By the time the model finishes running, this number could easily exceed one million. So again, we'll speed things up here. Once the model finishes running, the display switches to a table view. In the left column, we see the model parameters, including the lab numbers for the uncalibrated dates. The next three columns show the credible intervals, in this case 68.3% for unmodeled dates. What this means is simply calibrated radiocarbon dates that don't take the model parameters into account. Next, we see the data for the credible intervals for the modeled dates. Generally, these will differ from the unmodeled dates because they're constrained by the parameters of the model. You'll also see date estimates for the boundary events, such as the end of the Point Peninsula period. Note that the negative numbers are dates BC. A column near the right gives the agreement index for each date. And there's a warning in red text near the top indicating that some of the dates have very poor agreement with the model. And as we scroll down, we can see that there are two dates with rather low agreement indices, 12.2 and 43.8. This flags those dates as possible outliers. At the upper right corner, we can see some summary agreement indices. A model is the agreement index for the entire model, and A overall is kind of an average of the agreement indices for all the individual dates. You'll want all of these indices to be above 60, and in this case, they're clearly not. You also see another index labeled C that stands for convergence. You're, you want to have at least 95% convergence on all your dates meaning that the Markov chain Monte Carlo sampler converged on a single solution. From the Edit menu, we can select which time units we want to use in our models, such as AD, BC, or Cal BP. For the remainder of this video, I'll use CE and BCE. Personally, I tend to avoid using Cal BP because people tend to confuse it with uncalibrated dates. From that edit menu, we can also select what credible intervals we want to use. We can select from one or more of 68.3, 95.4, or 99.7%. If we click on any of the parameters in the left column, or use the View menu to select Plot Single, this brings up a view of the individual calibration. The red Gaussian distribution represents the uncalibrated determination. The dark gray area is the probability density function for the modeled calibrated date. And the light gray area is the PDF for the unmodeled calibrated date. Generally, the probability distribution for the modeled date will be narrower than that for the unmodeled date. At upper right of the plot, we see some summary information about the date, including its agreement index, the lab number and uncalibrated determination, and the credible interval for the date, which also appears as a sort of bracket underneath the probability density function, here from 624 to 403 BC. The arrow keys in the upper right corner allow users to scroll through the various plots, including those for radiocarbon dates and the boundaries between groups of dates. Note how in this case, a substantial plateau is caused by modal distribution in the calibrated date.
so the credible interval is divided into two distinct intervals, one of about 36 and the other of about 32 percent. As we continue to scroll through the plots, we eventually come to one for a boundary, in this case for the end of the Point Peninsula period. Notice how the probability density function here is asymmetrical, with a long tail to the right, while the boundary for the next phase, Princess Point, is skewed in the opposite direction. That happens because these events are only constrained by radiocarbon dates on one side of the boundary. Rather than viewing these plots one at a time, we can also go to the View menu and select Plot Dates. This displays probability density functions for all the events that are selected with the checkbox on the table. Here we see all the plots because the system defaults to checking all the rows in the table. In addition, we can select Plot on Curve from the View menu to superimpose the probability density functions on the calibration curve. This tends to be too crowded when there are a lot of events, but can be useful if you select only a subset of the events. You can use the checkboxes in one of the columns to the right to select which determinations or which parameters you want to include in your multiple plot view. You can also generate a report of the model specifications. or produce a schematic of your model. It's important to save your work, and if you're planning to make any changes to your model, do use the Save As command to save it with a different name. As I'd like to change to an abutting model, I'll add the word abutting after the file name, and click on the Save button. What that means is that we'll now assume that the event marking the end of one period is the same as the event marking the beginning of the next period. So, in this model, the end of Point Peninsula is identical to the beginning of Princess Point. Next, I'll go to the list view of the model, although you could use one of the other views, and begin to edit the boundaries between periods. First, I select the boundary for the end of Point Peninsula and select Edit from the Edit menu. I then change the name to indicate that this boundary now represents an abutting boundary between Point Peninsula and Princess Point phases. This makes the boundary for the start of the Princess Point phase redundant, so I select it and then delete it by using the Delete button marked by an X at upper right. I then make similar edits at the end of the Princess Point phase so that there's only a single boundary there. Once again, it's a good idea to check your work before saving this new version of the model. You might also want to check it in model view or in reverse model view, in other words, in stratigraphic order. Once we're satisfied that everything looks okay, we select Run from the File menu. And once again, we have to wait while the model runs. When it's done, OxCal goes back to table view, and we see new values for the model dates as well as dates on the new parameters at the boundaries between the abutting periods. We're also getting a couple of those warnings about dates that don't fit very well. We would want to investigate these as possible outliers. In fact, this one has an extremely low agreement index of only 16.5 and that investigation might lead us to omit them from the model and rerun it. We can use the checkboxes in the table view to select only particular dates to include in the multiple plots. As before, we can use the drop-down menu to view multiple plots of all the probability density functions for the different parameters. Notice that this time the probability density functions for boundaries between periods don't have those long tails because they're constrained by dates above and below them. By clicking on the arrows to the left of page at upper right, we can reverse the order of the plots so that they reflect stratigraphic order. Finally, let's revise the model one more time to show how we can use it to compare the archaeological events 
with some known historical event. And I'm going to assume here that our investigation showed that those two dates were indeed outliers, so I'll remove them from the model. You can see here how different the unmodeled distributions are from the probability density functions for the modeled dates. This demonstrates how poor the agreement is. I'll show two ways to remove those, starting first with the model view. After finding the first errant date, we click on the blue dot to its left, and then click on the delete button just to the left of the cut button. Once we go back to the list view, we can cut the other outlier by clicking on the dot immediately to its left and then clicking on the delete button. Either of these methods will delete the dates just as well. In this case, we'll make a comparison with the beginning of the Little Ice Age, a cold period that began around 1300 CE. Once again, we'll save the model with a different name. Next, I'll click on the second dot from the bottom so I can enter information about our climatic event. First, I enter a phase, but I don't give it a name. Then, from the Insert menu, I click on C Date, which stands for Calendar Date. I'll name this Little Ice Age and give it a date of 1300, plus or minus 20, since we can't say when the Little Ice Age began with certainty. I then scroll in the File menu to Date, and in the name field, I'll type an equal sign and then the name of the boundary that I want to compare the Little Ice Age with. Then, from the Insert menu, I click on Others and then scroll down to Order. And leave the name field blank before entering. These have now been added to the bottom of the model. At this point, we can save the model and then run it. As usual, the status panel will open so you can observe the progress of the model as it runs. When the model finishes running, we have a new table of results. You'll note with those outliers removed, the agreement indices are much better than they were before. If we click on Order, a new panel opens up with a table showing the probability that Event 1 happened before Event 2. This indicates a 61% probability that the early Ontario Iroquoian period came to an end before the Little Ice Age started. Those were very simple examples of period-based models but the events in models do not have to be the boundaries between periods. As in this example I showed earlier, they can be events like the last use of a hearth or the cutting of a pit. Finally, I'd like to end with a few tips on good habits in how to report your radiocarbon results. First, you should always report the uncalibrated determination BP along with its standard error. You should also report the lab number, the material that was dated, the fractionation and any reservoir correction that was made, and the context of the specimen that was dated. For calibrated dates, never report means or medians. Instead, report the beginning and end of the credible interval and state what that credible interval was, 95.4%, 68%, or whatever. And the calibrated dates should always be given with Cal BC, Cal BCE, Cal AD, and so on to indicate that they're calibrated dates, and it's also a good idea to put them in italics. It's also not uncommon to use CalBP, although I prefer not to use BP for calibrated dates because it tends to cause confusion. I hope you found that video helpful in your understanding of chronometric dating and the kinds of pitfalls that can occur and how we can avoid those pitfalls, uh, and also how we can use software to help us interpret sets of radiocarbon dates and, and give us very good chronologies in many cases. If you'd like to learn more about this topic, you can check out chapter 20 of my book, The Archaeologist's Laboratory, uh, published by Springer, as well as the, some of the uh, references that I cite in that chapter.
And I'll also make some links down below in this video so that you can get some more information about this topic. Um, I also want to remind you that if you want to be updated as I make new videos, you can always click on the subscribe button down below. Thank you, and stay safe.